thank you. And uh, I would really uh, like to say like hello in Swedish, but one of my dearest and closest friends that happens to live in Sweden say that I can't even ask for coffee properly. So uh, I, I don't start speaking Swedish too much, but yeah. And there's some disparity between what was printed on the text and on this, but it's a happy little accident like we all are. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, gaming capital, it's its a bit uh, very different topic than has been already been talking today, but uh, this is, as I said, like my research area. My background is basically in game production, game design, and then internet and game studies, and now I then decided that I will want to focus on, on you know, like player and avatar and, and gamer behavior. And this, today I'm talking about <coughs> the gaming capital and how it is present in in both like digital and virtual game worlds and in like tabletop role playing game. And but first we have to, of course, do the boring part, which is defining what we don't mean by gaming capital. And it is uh, about 15 year old concept that was <coughs> presented by Mia Console in her book, Cheating in an Advantage Media Games, uh, to come with given uh, like a name or categorization for what the player does with the information. Uh, and status they gain from playing games, like when they talk about uh, games outside the game world itself, like in, in store or a cafe with a colleague or a classmate. And then that is, is the name given name came, came capital. But then again, like everything in soft sciences, humanities included, it's really perspective relative, how you approach it, what how one does study uses. And so here it's like just a couple broad examples how it is like knowledge basically refers to all the information about the game you get, like let's say watching Let's Play videos or streams or read about in magazine or go to Seed Code Central. I don't know if that website is up anymore, but anything you learn about the game information itself. And then you have the experience of where you play the game itself, like be inside the game at action, like playing the D&D campaign or playing with Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV or something. That is also you gain information is basically you could see the same information played through the tutorial area, but how you get the information is changed because you are the active participant in the experience one in the knowledge, but you are passively absorbing information through videos or interaction in chats or something like that. And then you have the skills that are gained from both of these in some way. You know how to navigate the game world, you know some things about the rules of the game. And but <clears throat> then again we need social interactions and we all being, you know, internet people, we don't really have friends, so who we go to talk to behind some avatars in Twitter and claim that this game sucks. And then we have a fight in Twitter feed that someone is like, no, you suck and so on, like it happens. So it's like you they, in this very space, we could have the best, absolutely best Super Mario Kart player ever. But since they can't talk about it because they are, let's say, introvert or they have some linguistic uh, issues that they can convey the information on the skills they have, we would never know. So that's why in order for you to kind of concretize your knowledge and came in capital, you have to be able to talk about it in, in some way. And this is what I'm calling like the social spaces and then everything. So I guess this is enough definition of gaming capital for this, I hope. <laughs> so, but how it is in, in present in role playing spaces, I'm here, specifically talking about MMORPGs like with Warcraft and Kid Wars 2 and EVE Online and, and so and then tabletop role-playing games like D&D &D and, and the main version and then some more like special versions like Mansions for Madness or Descent into Madness and, and somewhat specialized it still utilizes the same kind of rule set. So in video games you basically especially in MMORPGs you have mouse and keyboard as your main interface. So you have tooltips where you can hover up certain items, spells, abilities, and they give you information like what is it about, like what it does, or how it functions, what's the purpose of it. And maybe some items have some flavor text that make, like they don't really add anything extra flavor, like there is in Sims 4, there's an uh, like ceramic bunny that is named Stanley. What does the player do with information that it's named Stanley? Who knows, but it's added there, just add some spirit and, and, and same, same as in many games, there is some really disturbing facts as well, if you like really go into that. And then you have the word is, is told as game itself, I mean, it's static word, it doesn't change and every video game presents itself, like the word itself, basically the same 
for everyone. Of course, this Minecraft is a bit different, but it's not relevant to this one. But for like World of Warcraft, it's, oh, you see all the same starting areas. You have seen the main stories, everyone is the same. Basically, you go there, say the word, yeah, then you do it again, the next expansion, and again, and again, and then you wonder what, but it's, it's going on. Then you have, everything happens to the character's eyes, in the sense that all the NPCs talk to the character, they are not breaking the fourth wall, being like, hey, whoever you are in Finland or in South Korea, whatever, it's like you human or you elf or something, and it's kind of talked in that way. And then, because it's a video game, all the goalposts for the players are like they're strictly defined. They are really static as well. What you do in the game in terms of the world and everything is, is static. It's all the same. How you do it is a bit different. Like, do you speed through it in 15 hours or do you take your time and take two months? It's up to you, but still you do the same things. And these are, are known to players in, in some way. They are not really hidden or there are no hidden agendas or something. And same goes with the lore. It's, it's just being told as like in the same way. It's, of course, it varies between games, how it goes. Like, is it like a, this kind of a wordless communication that you have seen kind of ruins and you have different skeletons telling a story how they have been dead? Or is there a quest to go there and inspect more? It's still st telling the story as such. It's, you can't affect it. You don't do it. But of course, as a player, you do your own interpretations of it, but it doesn't affect the game world itself. The game world communicates to you, but you can't really communicate back. But then again, with tabletop, I based this on my anecdotal experience of my first D&D campaign I started last year. So it is basically, there is also descriptions of spells, abilities, and the guidebooks are massive because they have to have everything. And it takes time to scroll through hundreds of pages to find what does my spell fireball do at rank two, and then have fight with Game Master, can I use it in a small space or not without killing everyone, including party members? And, and it, it's like, it's the same word could be typed in, in, in tabletop and virtual world, but how it is present changes. And like in, in video games, you just press on some, like an keyboard and something happens. And it's always basically the same. There is slight variation, but then again, D&D is how the actions go, how the information and your skills go is based on dice rolls. You can have a critical fail and you die. You can't have that basically in the same way in video virtual worlds, you can, but it's not a dice roll. It's basically the action is, is very, interaction is very different. And then you have the role of the game master for tabletop, where basically the game master is the god goddess or something like that, that uh, kind of, <laughs> decides has the final word on how things go. Uh, in, in, in like World of Warcraft, you don't have interaction with game masters, anything the game is, and it's really strictly rule bound. For game master, it's more negotiable. Like, can I have something based on my race? Like for my character, it was a dragonborn, but uh, has an affinity for eyes. And then with some <clears throat> nice words to game master, a couple of years later, I was able to use equivalent of fireball, but it was an, uh, like a frozen orb, like just to have the same effect, but it's a different element. It's like those negos that I could not have in virtual games because they have to strictly define this is how it goes, you like it or not. And in D&D, it's like how your relationship with the game master is dictates how much you like it or the game master likes it. And also like how it's the gaming capital and, and your skills and information and, and how you approach the game varies. <clears throat> And then you have the overlaps, the characters itself. I'm going to say mostly fictional because you have people recreating some, let's say, Trump or some political figures as like a caricatures or, or something like that. Or you have people going on like going like Avengers or something like that and, and, and try to kind of role play Iron Man in medieval fantasy setting just because it's possible. And it's, it's like this, and then you have people like I've been talking today, a previous list that some players might feel it easier that they create themselves in some kind of idealized version of themselves to approach the game. Like if I was here, how I would do it. Yeah, then it's, it's not fictional in the sense I'm talking about here. And then information, like I said, it's, it's given, but it's given 
But at canonical level, something like Firefall is described as the most destructive spells there is. That doesn't tell anything to players. Like, and then you said it deals 50 damage when enemies have like 20. Yeah, okay, it's, it's bad. I mean, because this is the layered information that needs to happen. So players have an idea when you have 15 different descriptions. Yeah, this spell might, I don't disorient enemies, but what does it mean? How long it lasts? Is it worth using? And then you have the programming code, especially for Virtus, acting as the limit. What's the variance, how the technology is, how what the game engine is built on, how flexible it is. And, and then you have kind of social code for tabletops, like what's the relationship between the players and the game? Is it completely random people or is it like a family where you have a bit more, like what is the destructive? Can you edit it or change it? And then in both cases, imagination plays a big role, how it is. Like distract, distraction means, even in this social space for every, everyone, it means different things. Everybody has an idea what distraction means. But then again, it functionally works the same way. It well, destroys stuff. The difference is, like I said, Game Master is an active participant in tabletop ones. It's like they're telling to a berserker that, yeah, you have to roll strength or, or, or dexterity check or something. In virtual, you just press buttons and then see what happens. And, and then again, it's, it's up to Game Master to make it fluid experience. And if there is some Game Master is like, eh, no, just do like a survival check or intelligent check, you might, you, you are able to dispute that if you feel it's, it's a bit odd. And then again, for MMOs, they are some, sometimes called sandbox games or amusement park games, where you just go and do whatever in the huge world. But then again, for D&Ds, the information and everything you have is, is you go as together as a party from start to finish. It's, so it's, it's like a very different thing. You know, so like it's a guided round trip where you follow whatever Game Master tells you to go and then how you do it at the macro level is basically up to players. And then there is negotiable expertise and as I said, like it's, it's so much more like this session zero for the end is, is extremely important. Like where you set the boundaries, how you want to be, like who is the party, what, uh, what's the backstory. In MMOs, it's you just create a character pop in and, and that's it. There may be some lore and canon behind it where the character is, how the word reacts to it. But as a player, you're completely new. You don't have to kind of think and thinking is hard. <laughs> and then we have the social spaces, which is the kind of main beef here. It's like there is two layers for it. It's like in-game and, and anything outside social spaces. And then you have something like guilds and, and groups having Discord servers kind of blurring the line because the language is still used is what the game is using, but it's happening outside the gaming experience. So it kind of mixes things up. And then we get to this. So in, in video games, it's, it's all about individualism, basically. We, we could have give everyone here a computer, somehow make them play the same game. And I would bet half never meet the other half because they choose to have different experience or we used to have different names. We not re really go there to play with our real life names. We might be the God Slayer 69 or something like that. And, and, and then die to the first rat to meet because bug or something like that. And, and then it's, it's like it's and all the game session is always it's not it's limited to the same set a lot of games have different servers imagine like different rooms here we would all be playing the same game but because we are in different social space we never meet uh, or or something like that and then because it's it's virtual it's the game is running even if the player is not playing so it's up to the individual itself to decide how much they play and, and when they play and because it's digital all it's virtually global reads you can play with anyone from this space, anyone in Discord, in Zoom, and in YouTube. Was it three years or something like that? And and uh, and it's it's all like you can meet. It's basically the physical space requirement for social interaction is removed. And uh, then because how they are built, you can choose in ninety nine percent of the time if you play alone or in a group, and you can play in a group some content that you don't really need to be. Uh, in group four because you just enjoy playing sorry with someone but for analog games or tabletops 
it's like you, it, because it's it's a group play from start to finish. You, you people should be like take a lot of time to kind of find and utilize abuse the freedom to form like a fellowship of, of like-minded people that there is some understanding like okay this is how we're going to play the game and, and this is how it's going to go and if we would separate people here it would be separated by the table and each table would have widely different uh, uh, like levels of, of gaming capital and how they communicate and how the campaigns are going to go even if it would be the same campaign and then the game only progresses when everyone has the time to do it that's why a lot of horror 3 d people they have to set like a uh, like a, a once a month or something for a couple of hours to do uh, stuff and then you have if you have split interest someone has to want to be a thief and someone just wants to kill all the orcs how that plays out is up to the game master and and then you have a bit of beer and alcohol maybe some chocolates to you know sweeten up the game master and make some negotiable but then again sad it's not a solo experience even if you can't do decision on your own do you want to charge and kill an enemy or kick the door down? But it has greater degree of freedom how an invasion goes, how uh, like um, restocking, hackling goes. In virtual games, it doesn't. It, it, it's, it's so strict by the rules. And But yes, in conclusion, too much. I already used my time and I, I really don't have time. <coughs> Sorry. But yes, and even what if we found when people just Partly take like okay, I'm gonna watch this DD group from this point of view, and then you have enough to for the next, I don't know, 20 years. Thank you. <laughs>